We are back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us. Todd Matthews is with us this morning. He is an expert in unidentified and missing persons cases, has worked for the Department of Justice. He uh, is um, now, I guess, basically a consultant and, mm -hmm. and follows a lot of these cases. Talk about, okay, you said there's so many stories out there. What are some that you recall that you've been involved with? Again, you were called one of the original cyber sleuths, which was using computers and mm -hmm. the internet to try to make links and solve these missing persons or unidentified cases? Well, back then it was new. 1998, not every law enforcement agency in the country had a website. Mm -hmm. So uh, right. when they saw my success with Tent Girl, I literally had agencies that would come to me and say, we have a missing person. Can you put it online? Okay, so Tent Girl is what got it started. And this was, this was a case where they had a body. Mm -hmm. Okay, law enforcement had recovered a body. It was a homicide. She was wrapped up in a canvas tent. Okay, but they didn't know who she was. From 1968. From 68, way mm -hmm. back. It was your father-in-law. That found the body. That found Before the body. Before I was born. Before you were born. Mm -hmm. So then you start investigating this case saying, okay, so we have this body. We believe it's a homicide, but we don't know who she is. If we can find out who she is, it might help solve the case. So the, the thing about the, the case was my wife told me about it. She, we were, I was 17, she was 16, 1987. <laughs> so it was, it was you know, just shortly after I'd met her. It was Halloween. That was yeah. the time of year it was. So it was, it was her ghost story. The story was so encrusted with urban legend okay. type lore around it that it almost seemed like something that wasn't even true. And this was where? Where was? The that was in uh, north of Lexington, Kentucky, in Georgetown. Okay, so, right. And we were in Livingston, Tennessee now. All right. So uh, the story had a very urban legend, but it seemed very familiar to me. My wife even looked familiar. When I met mm -hmm. her, it's like, I know that girl. You know, yeah. it was just bizarre, like it was meant to be. and. Um, I got to talk to my father-in-law about the case, and he told me more details. He felt like, originally they thought tent girl, they thought she was a young girl, but he saw her body. He saw her painted fingernails. He saw a baby diaper that was in the bag. He said he saw her breasts were developed. So this was an older woman. He said he did not think it was a child. Okay. So that was the and mindset. And maybe a mother. And maybe a mother, and she sure. was. Okay. So I took what I learned from him instead of what I read in the newspaper from those old articles. What I read in the Master Detective was all geared in a different direction. So I took what he believed and what I believed and I was looking for somebody that was older with children. So then you, you started searching databases online? Well, there wasn't many databases right. back in 1997 up until 1998. So I was looking at websites. Everybody knows what Craigslist is mm -hmm. today. It was a website called Crane and Hibbs. Uh, because I was just literally, there was no Google then. I was literally web searching sister, mother, daughter, missing. Yeah. And just for years, <laughs> I built a website for uh, Tent Girl, or be on the lookout basically. This is what we know about this body. This is what I think. And I thought somebody would contact me, like that's, that's my mother, brother, sister, you know, something. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. So I got back to getting online and searching, and I found a posting from her sister, sister last known to be in Lexington, Kentucky. She mentioned a height, which was was just a little over five foot, which was short. Uh, she mentioned children. Okay. So I made contact with her, and that's something you shouldn't do today. That I did what you shouldn't do today. Like if you see somebody talking about a missing person online and they're reaching out, you don't go and say, this unidentified body might be your mom. Yeah. You know, you go through law enforcement, but at the time there was no channels like that to go through. There wasn't anybody you could just email or 800 call. There was right. no really centralized databases. So it was, uh, I called her. You so know, you called her, and what did you, what, how'd that conversation, you said? Uh, well, I had enough, you know, you're telling somebody your sister's an urban legend in Kentucky, which mm -hmm. is like, she's gonna think this guy's crazy, uh, it's mm -hmm. not true, but I had a website that it had detailed everything, and she looked at it and found enough, like, this is true. Now, where were the remains at this point? They were buried in a, a cemetery in Georgetown, Kentucky. Okay, and so how were you able then to get confirmation through her that this was, did they have to exhume the body? Yes, that was a, a, a yeah. conversation between Rosemary Westbrook and I. Uh, she said, so what happens next? How do I know if this is my sister? And, you know, we all watch television. So mm -hmm. I said, I imagine there will be a DNA test. Yeah. And it's there was. Okay, because at this point, DNA was on the table, of course. It was, but and you didn't just exhume a body for the purpose of collecting <coughs> DNA. And nowadays, you will see that. You will see uh, law enforcement agencies that will proactively exhume a body for DNA collection because they can put the DNA into CODIS and possibly match to somebody. Back in that 1998, you pretty much had to have a presumptive ID, like, my theory is this. Okay. So it wasn't just randomly done. So it's, it's, it's really different. So what I did at the time, which was seen very highly specialized, 
it's old school now. Yeah. Law enforcement do all of this stuff themselves, you know, so at one time you're the cyber sleuth that they're going to. Uh, finally, they evolved to the point that they're doing all of this. So mm -hmm. for me, it's time to move on and tell the stories. You know, you're not you're not providing right. a unique thing for people anymore. Sure. They no longer need to come to me or the volunteer community. Can you put this online? They have their own databases. They have their own way of doing things. It's ingrained in them. Uh, you, you know, some of the, the staff of NamUs. I've done this. We've taught at the Tennessee Police Academy, mm -hmm. Kentucky State Police Academy. So they're, it's been put into them early. Uh, it's been instilled into. It's not something they learn later or a process has changed, they've learned it from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know. What did, they, what did she die of? Well, they think she it. actually suffocated in the bag. Her fingernails were broken off, and it's, it's very likely that maybe she wasn't dead when she was put into the bag. Oh. There was a bruise on her skull that indicates maybe some type of trauma. But maybe she wasn't dead. He might not have even known she wasn't dead. Okay, and they ended up having a suspect, never really the, arrested. The suspect was, in general, her her husband. Husband, because he had, he had given a, a scenario that they didn't find truthful. Um, and we did an episode of Who Killed Jane Doe, probably a year before last, and we finally a lot of the family got to talk about it. It was a season two of Who Killed Jane Doe. And I think it was a very good episode. If people want to take a look at it, they can see the story in more complete details than it's ever been told. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it was good because the family finally got to fill in some of the gaps of who was Barbara Hackman? Who was she? Well, did she have children? Yes, she had children. And so they're still alive today? Uh, yes. And they know what happened to their mother, thanks to you, I suppose. Well, uh, thanks to uh, before <coughs> I came along, their father gave them enough information to help find their aunts. And so their family had reunified, and they were trying to find her, and then we just sort of hit head on, and uh, wow, it turned into well, a whole new world. And that was the first case for you that you really yes. you delved into that. So you were awful young at that point. That's where you decided, oh, I want to do this kind of stuff. From seventeen to twenty-seven, From and I, I, that that yeah. was I spent that much time working on that particular case. And uh, at first, it was a very manual search. It was drive there, uh, talk to my father-in-law, take notes, get newspaper. Well, articles. How are you making a living at this point? You're uh, at a factory. Oh, because working. you were working. So this I was, was working at assembly at a factory, and then ultimately, before I left there, I was working in quality control. So I'd worked up to a nice office job. Mm -hmm. um, identified tent girl. Well, I gave them the information that led yeah. to her identification. And then um, <coughs> Discovery ID, I did uh, CBS 48 Hours. Mm -hmm. That was the first media group that reached out to okay. me. And that, the day that aired on, on Channel 5, mm -hmm. uh, literally knocks on the door. My sister died of, uh, she fell from a cliff in Livingston. It was a police officer. Yeah. He said, my sister, Vicki Bertram, her case. Mm. Um, he had an autopsy that said she fell into a limestone quarry and there was no broken bones. We exhumed her body. Mm -hmm. It was almost like you become an expert in something, but you're not really an expert in something. Like, yeah. you know. So it was. I, I helped exhume that body and we did do another autopsy. I took her to the University of Tennessee. There were multiple broken bones. Now I couldn't prove if she did or did not fall from that cliff, but I can say we can't say that she died of, of, of suicide. We can't say that that fall. So to go back and be able to kind of change that, the stigma of suicide is real. That, real, case that was case? back in 2001. Okay. That's it was that. almost immediately. It was a few years till we got back to the point that we could exhume the body. Right. And the family agreed with it, uh, and her brother was a police officer. So it was it was really a difficult case, and that wasn't a missing or unidentified person. That was a a cold case. Mm-hmm. And. Um, just one thing led to another, led to another, led to another, and there was a few big breakthroughs back in the day. Ultimately, it got the Department of Justice's attention and uh, helped them build the NamUs database. And now it's time to, what's next? Yeah, yeah. You know, what's next? And I really want to tell the stories. I want to work with people like you on a daily basis <coughs> and make sure that I can provide information so that you can tell the story. Right. Well, they're fascinating stories when you see them from beginning to end in the way it comes. And people yeah. love that. Like I said, that's the basis of so many television shows these days, mm -hmm. cold cases and solving them. But the big thing is just, to me, solving the cases. And the maddening yes. ones are the ones that don't get solved that still hang out there. And the tips continue to come in. Every news station periodically will do an update on Tabitha Tudors. And I've come to know her parents. All the media in town that's been here for a while have come to know her parents, yeah. who are wonderful people. And that they live with every day not knowing. How 
What's it going to take to Missing solve that case? Missing can be worse than dead. I was going to say. Maybe, and I mention that know. often. I know. know. You wonder. And I've asked her mother this years ago. I mean, not knowing, I suppose you hold out the hope that somehow, some way, she's alive out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that gives you any comfort. Um, finding the body, I guess, to some degree, answers the question of what happened. Yeah. What would you rather have? Never knowing or finding out that she's dead? I don't. I, I can't imagine. I guess I'd have to be in that position to answer truthfully. I know, and, and, and it, to, to actually make that choice now, I would think that I would want some type of closure because I don't think I would want to pass on from this world not knowing what happened to my son. Did they? Are they okay? Did they suffer? I've had a friend in Texas. Her father was a long-term missing person. She said, I felt guilty being warm because I didn't know if he was cold. I felt guilty eating because I didn't know if he was hungry. Mm -hmm. And right. I can see that going that on. maddening. And always, yeah, the, always hanging. Whereas if you find out, God forbid, they're dead, yeah. kind of like the case with Evelyn Boswell now, is something where at least you know that and you can mourn her. And you can actually, uh, it's just like the funeral. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you have the period of grieving. I think everybody... Missing does not compute, and I've said that before. Uh, uh, we're not programmed to watch our children die, but it happens. Uh, we all know we're going to die. Everybody deals with mm -hmm. it. I think we can process it ultimately knowing, but that not knowing, it just don't compute. I don't right. think anybody can ever pull their lives together and have a full life not knowing. You know, I had a brother and sister that passed away as infants, but I knew where they were. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it, but... Uh, it doesn't affect my day-to-day -day life now because it's now if they had been murdered, I don't think I'd ever, or if, or if they were just gone, I would constantly be looking. You'd for always them. be wondering, right? Where are they? And uh, you know, I'm not looking for them because I know exactly where they're at. I know exactly. Where How at. is it too? I wonder in some of these cases, like Joe Clyde Daniels, where we talk about the child's remains never being found. Mm -hmm. And you wonder how it makes it more difficult for the prosecution because you can make the argument without having any remains, how do you even prove that they're dead? And yet law enforcement has said, okay, that Joe Clyde Daniels is presumed dead and mm -hmm. they're calling it a homicide case. They don't have a body, but what is it, at what point can you get to where you know law enforcement makes that assumption, especially maybe in a child's case where they say, look, we don't have a body, but this five-year-old's dead. Well, there's a whole lot of circumstances behind the okay. scenes. Something yeah, that they a lot said, into it. Uh, something that they found out during an investigation at yeah. some point in time. So they have enough information that's, you know, presumed. And that, that's a key word, presumed, Dan. Well, especially a five-year-old just yeah. vanishing. I mean, maybe a teenager who maybe decides to just take off. But a five-year-old just vanishing without a trace, they don't do that on their own. No. Right? And you, and you really can't do that on your own. You know, a child case has to have the ultimate... <clears throat> awareness because you can't just make a decision to go missing if you're a minor you just can't now an right. adult they're harder that's why with the state law in Tennessee uh, being 30 days that's mostly for an adult that's not the, the the earliest that it can be put in a national database that's the latest that it should be mm -hmm. uh, a missing adult if you're gone for 30 days 30 I days. hope that somebody's gonna put me in a national database at that point uh, law enforcement can say it should be Tomorrow, if they have enough information to but say, foul play or yeah, like, like that. I want them yeah. in there now. So there's no limit as far as that. Law enforcement can act as quickly as possible as they want, but because they don't doesn't mean they don't care. Right. It doesn't mean they're not following a the protocol. They're usually very effective. Uh, in Tennessee and Kentucky, I've known some of the law enforcement officers personally more so than the other 48 states, and uh, I've seen some very compassionate people that really are trying to do the right thing uh, as, as effectively as possible. But there are guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, there's criminal cases that have to be built, and, and the family are never going to get that resolution soon enough. Right. So, you know, you try to help them be patient, and that's like your, your hair is on fire. Be patient. Well, yeah. And then you're trying not to share too much information sometimes with the family, only from the sense, and you hate to say that, that you don't want them to start putting it out there or getting frustrated. I know mm -hmm. there have been cases where law enforcement has had to kind of back away from even sharing stuff with the family because of the situation. Listen, we'll take a break. When we come back, our final segment, we'll talk more about some of these unidentified and missing persons cases with our guest Todd Matthews right after this.